If it wasn't for crowdfunding, our, you know, our speaker list would actually be very different today. And so, you know, speaking of Kickstarter, as, as our two guests just did, we're actually going to bring up John Biggs to talk to Yancey Strickler, who is the CEO and co-founder of Kickstarter. So please welcome him to the stage. <laughs> welcome, look, look, see all these people that came for you. What's up, everybody? <laughs> so this is Yancey Strickler, CEO, co-founder, Super Ninja from Kickstarter. How you doing? I'm doing good. How are you guys doing today? So let's get a little energy. It's been, it's like <laughs> 9, 9 50, what time is it? 9.55? Everybody, let's clap. It's Yancey. We're here at Disrupt. You're not at work. I figure, I think we're actually on like the, um, how you say in English, like the, the training schedules for HR people. So people actually come here they, to get away from work. Oh, got it. Yeah, that's why I come here. Um, Oh, I lost my notes. I'm being so f flip. So, you guys had a party? Uh, yeah. So, this past Saturday, we had a block party uh, at our office in Brooklyn. Did anyone here happen to make it? A couple people did. Cool. Yeah, it was uh, a week ago today was our fifth birthday, and we have always had birthday parties, but this year we decided to go kind of nuts. So, we shut down the street outside of our office in Greenpoint and invited a few million people to come. Uh, and no, wait, slow down. So <laughs> back there, and this is amazing to me, because I didn't know that there were so many people in New York. 50,000 people came to your party? I have no idea how to guess crowds. The estimates that well, were being said. There's the 3 million people in this room right, right now. Yeah, exactly. So, so it's about three times as many. Yeah, I don't know. People were guessing anywhere from 10,000 to 100,000. I think 100,000 seemed way too big. But it was packed. Uh, we were giving tours of the office. People got to wander and see the workspace and see, like, uh, I don't know, where we hang out. And basically, it was an advertisement to come work at Kickstarter, if you want to, that part. Yeah. But then we had creators doing demos. Uh, we had a whole area where uh, tabletop board game creators were teaching people how to play their games, including Max Temkin was leading a big game of Cards Against Humanity with like oh 40 people. Hopefully, there were no kids around during that part. But uh, yeah, it was, it was a phenomenal day. I think it's the best thing that we've done in, in five years. So, and you also mentioned that we wrote, our, the first post about Kickstarter ever was one of ours. Yes. And we were very dismissive. Yeah, you were dismissive. And I still believe, I don't think, I don't think it has legs. I don't think, I don't think we're going to pull it off. <laughs> Fair it's enough, difficult, yeah. It's a difficult, it's a difficult market out there. And yeah. there's a lot of, a lot of competitors. Kickstarter, what does that mean? Yeah, exactly. That, it's like a exactly. Kickstarter. I don't know what that means. <laughs> uh, speaking of board games, you also said, how much, how many million in board games? Yeah, as of uh, this week, we'll cross $100 million having been pledged to board games on Kickstarter. Um, last year, actually, there was more money pledged to board games than video games uh, through the site. It's like $55 million to board games. Mm -hmm. uh, it's kind of counterintuitive versus the way we think that the world is moving, but I think the board game market on Kickstarter is very illustrative of what it is that we actually do. I, mean, I remember meeting someone in like 2009 or 2010, really early for us, who said that Kickstarter was the first thing to change the board game industry since the early 70s. And basically it's this huge fan community of people who were like making their own games, games are talking about, they're doing like mods to D&D, things like that. Mm -hmm. But they weren't at a scale to where, you know, a Parker Brothers or a Milton Bradley would drop a huge bunk of change on it. And so we ended up stepping in and being like this perfect conduit for these communities to exist. And so through that you have something like Cards Against Humanity, which is one of the top selling toy products on Amazon for the past three years. Uh, so that market has just become huge and it's just an amazing community and one I'm most proud of. So you see yourself not as, like a lot of, a lot of these guys will see you guys as a hardware company. You go there, you buy your Oculus, whatever. But what's the, what's the ultimate, what is the ultimate ob, uh, product that's on Kickstarter? What what's, identifies it most clearly? Yeah, this is the beautiful thing is that um, folks who are really, hard, really into hardware I think see Kickstarter as a hardware platform, which is great, and the games people see as a games platform, and film as a film platform. And you have all these communities. There's a lot of cross-pollination. There are very few backers who've only backed something in one category. Uh, it's generally very disparate. But, you know, it's hard for me to pick, like, the perfectly indicative project. I mean, like, the one I maybe come back to is the very first project to get funded, which raised $35 from three backers. That was one of me. Yeah, so not quite pebble level, but you know, <laughs> still pretty great. And this is from a guy who just said, you know, give me five bucks and I'll draw you a picture of something. <laughs> and I still think that is like, kind of embodies the Kickstarter ethos of just like, here's this thing I'd like to do, be a lot cooler to do it with you. It's a, it's a lazy guy who wants $5. <laughs> 
And is it going to draw pictures for you? You know, that's art. That's art. Oh, wow, that is art. <laughs> you really think about it. Um, have we reached peak crowdfunding? Are people exhausted by crowdfunding? Because I, 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 I did some crowdfunding, and the people that I know are exhausted by me. Yeah. It's, it's, a, it's a very... That might be a separate issue. So, no, uh, well, it's true. <laughs> but, I mean, I found, that, I found that email works really well, but then I send 5,000 emails, and then I also found that, that there's so many crowdfunding projects out there that I don't even want to write about them anymore. Like, there's great hardware projects, but it's just like, it's already been done because it was done four weeks ago, and you just emailed me five times. Right. Yeah, I got, I got your emails. I, uh, yeah. Do you? Yeah, I got to get your emails. Oh, uh, yeah, I mean, I think that, uh, I think as a journalist, obviously you're in like a perfect storm of a lot of people who are trying to speak okay. through you. Um, no, I mean, I think that, I mean, I think that crowdfunding is bigger than ever and also smaller than people think. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the, the projects that you see on Kickstarter get tons of attention and Kickstarter itself seems to be like a, I don't know, top 20 brand on the internet or something, even though traffic wise, we're, you know, nowhere near that. Mm -hmm. um, but these things have resonated very in a very big way because they are, it's just a very new feeling type of thing. But, you know, about six million people are back to Kickstarter project, which is a lot, a lot, but still, I mean, thinking in Facebook terms, like that's, that's nothing. Well, that's about as many people as came to your party, right? Yeah, essentially, well, twice million. as many people came to the party. <laughs> uh, but no, I mean, I don't think so. I mean, this is a, this is a model that's still uh, pretty new. I mean, internet-wise, when we were five, five years old, I realized that's like, mm -hmm. you're way over the hill in internet terms at that point. Uh, but people are still iterating on this model that, you know, that, that uh, we've pioneered and continue to lead. And, you know, I think it has a long, long his uh, history in front of it. And what about, uh, I guess, crowd equity? And uh, that's, that's coming, and we all know it's coming. Uh, there's some legislation in the works. SEC is going to eventually allow it. Europe does it all the time simply because there isn't that much money. Are you guys going to be behind that? What's the plan there? Uh, we're planning on sitting that one out. Um, you know, I, I think that what we really like about... Kickstarter is that projects are funded just because people think they're cool, because they're excited about them. And because of that, you get all sorts of really weird, crazy things that get funded. And it's just an incredibly diverse universe of people making things just because they're excited about them. That was always a, a real motivator from us from the very beginning, from when you know, we first started working on this uh, for Perry, it was 12 years ago. Um, which is that the sort of art and, and culture that we liked are things that we knew were hard to get funded because it wasn't going to make anybody money. If you look at the way the culture industry or, or investment models work, someone gives you money and hope that they will make money themselves. Uh, and obviously that is the point of investment. But I think art works by different rules. I think creative things work by different rules. And when you look at everything through that prism, the idea, the concept of what becomes possible becomes much, much smaller. So I love the idea of just opening up that funnel to things existing just because people want them to. Mm -hmm. And I think that's enabled many more things to exist. So for us, we are an extremely mission-driven company, and our mission is to help people bring creative projects to life. And uh, my hypothesis is that our current model is going to best serve that mission. I mean, I think the issue is that the soul and spirit inside of me has been ground to dust over the past few years. Uh, I'm exhausted. And I, look at, drink and I we'll look at you. That. I look at you, and I'm like, he's he, he doesn't want he doesn't want like the big bucks. He wants to like help a man get a artistic film about his toe funded. It's a great, which is a great, very, movie. Which is, a great movie. Which is very, which is a very very the noble black and goal. Black was a great choice. I thought <laughs> it really is, and it's mostly dark. You really can't see <laughs> yeah, the toe until yeah. the very last frame, and then you're like, ah, oh, it's a yeah, toe. It's, it's an existential toe. Yeah. <laughs> it really is. It's like film noir. Um, <laughs> So anyway, yeah, so, I, so I'm, a, I'm a curmudgeon and I hate, I hate the world, but how are you going to maintain the happiness that's in your heart? Because it seems like... I mean, let's, I mean, honestly, that's a, you know, that's a huge, that's a huge, I mean, that's a life a, question, it's right? It's a giant question. That's a life question. I mean, I mean, I think for me, I mean, listen, like, um, you know, I've, I've been a part of Kickstarter since 2005. Uh, I randomly met my partner, Perry, um, and we became friends, and he told, this, told me this idea. I was like a a music critic before, all I've ever wanted to do is just like be in cultural things, that's all I've cared about. I became CEO uh, January 1st of this year, my partner Perry became chair, um, and you know, something like the block party, I mean the block party is a huge moment in the life of Kickstarter and in my life period because it's a chance to see what it is that we actually do, right? It's like this 
huge mass of people who are coming together just like really out of love for like each other and creating things and it's like it's so hyper sincere you had groupies coming to visit you they were like <laughs> flying in yeah there was yeah yeah there's a guy who flew from japan uh to to meet us there's probably a guy who flew from japan to meet you here too yeah uh, but like i mean we know we know who we are we know what we want you know we want a world where we have a lot more say in shaping what the world looks like and that we're not that we don't just acquiesce to the way the world seems to work and that and that we just have a voice and that there is this possibility to create something and i think that i think that art and culture are are not a frivolous thing i think that they help us shape the world and comment on it and i think it's incredibly important i mean this is the sort of stuff that when you think in sheer economic terms seems uh i don't know these are elective things that you think would go away in times of economic duress but we launched in april 2009 mm -hmm. the depths of the of the collapse uh and we've seen six million people around the world pledge a billion dollars to help each other do stuff and so i think that that what kickstarter speaks to and what the creators who use us speak to is something that's really really deep and so even if you look at um you know adam smith like the the father of of capitalism uh, one of his last works was called The Theory of Moral Sentiments, where he, su where he suggested that empathy, not self-interest, was the primary motivator of economic activity. Look where that got him. Yeah. Empathy, you know, and this is from, and this is from like, you know, Mr. Capitalism. And so I think that there's, I just think there's something deeper there. I think there's things that are more important to money than money. I think that there's, uh, I think the community is something that our hearts instinctively look for. And so for me, uh, I feel, I feel a great resolve and a, and a real privilege to be able to devote my life to that and to do it with uh, 84 really wonderful people and do it on behalf of the millions of people who are part of Kickstarter. And, you know, we take that very seriously and, and really just like honor and serve that as best we can. And so, I don't know, it, it really is heartfelt. Oh, thank you. It's, that's literally... That's literally the most genuine and heartfelt thing that's ever going to be said on this stage today or for the next three I days. I hope not. Because no, it, people have heartfelt things to say. It's just like, are you allowed to say those things or you have to like hype up your shit? You know, like well, what's, yeah. more, what's more important? I mean, it's, anyway. the, well, if I, the way I think about it is we're having, we used to have a one-to-many sort of situation with, I guess, capital. So to build this building, it, some one guy got together, built it for people, and then they pay him to use it. Right. Whereas could you kickstart a building like this? Could you kickstart Carnegie Hall? Probably, yeah, of course. I mean, I think in history, there are probably examples that, of that, like in the Enlightenment or things like that. I mean, we are, you know, we're, this is like a, this is a new model that has a very long history, right? 17th, 18th centuries, most art and culture was produced in a manner kind of similar to this. Um, patronage system. Patronage, patronage system, things like that. It's gone away for 300 years. The last 100 years have been dominated by mass media, media and like really big companies producing and commoditizing culture. The internet's made it to where there is an alternative choice to that. And right now we're in a moment of, uh, certainly there being new options uh, and maybe a transition off the old model into new and we'll see. I mean, I do think it's very, very early. I think something like Veronica Mars suggests that even something like Hollywood could work in a very different way that I think might be more healthy for everyone. But we'll see, I mean, these things take time. Um, we're not trying to like, I don't know, pour crazy gasoline on this or anything. I mean, I think that the public conversations that happen around when new things happen on Kickstarter, and that seemingly happens every week or two, mm -hmm. I think those are good because I think as a community and as a world, we need to figure out how it is we want things to work. I don't think that it should be dictated by any one person. I think there's a nice collective decision making that's ultimately happening on every project. Because when someone posts a project on Kickstarter, the world is ultimately saying yes or no. And I think that's good. I think that's an exchange of information and can be very genuine and sincere. So I, you know, I, I don't know, I trust in where this is gonna go. I trust in the voice uh, of the public, of audiences, of creators. Um, and I feel like, you know, that's, that's my job as, as, as leading this company. Now, how do you feel about the guys like Oculus who kinda, who made a lot of money on the backs of the, of the supporters and then like Nirvana sold out and then ruined everything for everyone? Do you think they did that? I'm glad you mentioned Nirvana, because um, I think a lot about Nirvana with Oculus. Okay. For real. Yeah. Uh, so, um, you know, the, the, the Twitter conversation about the Oculus Facebook thing was, was fascinating to me, because the way it felt, uh, it felt to me like when, if you were someone who bought 
the first Nirvana 7-inch, or like, we're, we're into Nirvana when they were still on Sub Pop, and then suddenly they're on MTV, and you're like, wait, that's my band. <laughs> what does this mean? You know, there's like, there's an identity that's very tied into this. And, um, and yet, now you see Wes Anderson making American Express commercials, White Stripes are in every commercial there is. Uh, even supposedly cool or micro culture art is now part of like the huge marketplace. And no one cares anymore. You very rare see anyone like raise their voices and say like, is this okay or not? It seems like we've largely just have given up on that conversation, we don't have it anymore. But yet you see it happen again with a piece of technology, with Oculus Rift. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think that the, that the sentiments you saw there were very, very similar. And to me, that was just a sign of to what degree culture has moved. I mean, I wonder, at one point, is there no longer a tech press because all press is tech press, right? I mean, it's... it's we it's, hope so. Yeah. Uh, you know, it, but just like culture has really shifted and the idea that there is that emotional ownership over something that is made and, you know, made by a manufacturer, I think would seem really foreign to us mm -hmm. uh, even a few years ago. I mean, I think Oculus, the idea that Oculus was for gamers, by a gamer, and it was supposed to be this cool, amazing thing that you, weren't, you, were, you wanted to show people, you wanted to show it off to your friends. So you, right. wanted to be the, you wanted to be the guy who played that 7-inch yeah. that of Nirvana for all your friends, and all of a sudden, everybody knows about it, and you kind of feel, you kind of feel they sold out. And I guess the question is, do you build businesses, or do you build projects, single projects? Yeah, I mean, it, I mean the Oculus thing, it, 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 it really is fascinating, because um, from a Kickstarter perspective, they had fulfilled all the rewards and done that, I think about a year and a half before, something like that. Uh, so there's this interesting question of when is, it, when is the Kickstarter project done? Mm -hmm. But obviously those backers still felt a great relationship and Oculus continued to post. I mean, they've been fantastic creators and been very, very engaged. Um, but yeah, it brings up, it brings up a, lot of, a, really, a lot of interesting questions. Uh, I myself was an Oculus backer. Uh, I didn't go for the full dev kit. I think it was like 25 bucks, yeah. something like that, just because you know, it seemed like amazing technology. And I got to use one about a year later and it was mind blowing. I mean, it's like one of those rare things that totally lives up to the hype. And you know, you go to like PAX and you see people lining up for an hour and a half to wear mm -hmm. them for 10 minutes and it is worth it. Uh, it's unreal. It's unreal what they've done. And, um, and for those guys, for Palmer and Brendan and that whole crew, you know, they are just like, they're creators and, and tech people who just want to make amazing stuff. And you know, that's where their heart is. And I think for them, they're looking to see how can we make Oculus what it's supposed to be. And uh, that's not an easy thing to do. And my assumption is that they made this decision with that in mind. My friend had one. He showed me one of the demos, and it was a toilet that you could go in and you could control the toilet, which is the Incredible, future. incredible. Is, how could you do that any other way? No, you really can't. <laughs> There's no other way. Do you still want to be CEO? Is it still fun for you? It's been uh, hard for you, right? It was, I'm just getting my legs under me. Yeah. You know, I. I um, you know, I was, uh, I guess, kind of the number two person at Kickstarter for a long time, and Perry uh, is a very good friend of mine, and, um, and all the changes were, like, very healthy, and, you know, we talked a lot about it, and, um, and I, yeah, at the very beginning, I wasn't totally sure, like, it felt, you know, was I allowed to step in fully and take that seat? Um, but this has been a, a year in which a lot has happened and in which uh, a lot has changed within Kickstarter. We moved to this space. I mean, the change in physical space has such a big impact. Um, and the team has grown considerably. I mean, we've added 17 people in the past three months, which is the fastest growth in terms of staff that we've ever had. But, and I feel good about it. I think I'm, I, I think I'm generally know what I'm doing based on my current levels of ignorance. Sure. Uh, we and rise I'm to, to our level of incompetence. Right. So I'm trying to stay point. focused on, on really what matters, but having someone like Fred uh, Wilson, who's uh, on our board and um, a, a great friend of ours and someone I talk to a lot, is helpful. And uh, I have some great uh, peer CEOs that I love talking to. Um, Ian Hogarth from Songkick is one of my best friends. Patrick Collison of Stripes, amazing guy. You know, uh, uh, Chad Dickerson at Etsy. These are people I love to talk to and just commiserate and learn from. So, you know, I've tried to approach this role with uh, a spirit of service and humility and real understanding. And uh, yeah, the first four or five months, I, I think, have been pretty healthy, and hopefully that continues. Okay. We got one minute. What's, give, give these, if they want to do a Kickstarter project, what shouldn't they do? What have you seen that's the worst? 
The worst thing to do. Um, email multiple people all the time for weeks on end. I think bad. emailing people is the right thing to do. Uh, I think it's just to be yourself. I mean, I, a lot of what I try to counsel people to do is don't get too crazy in trying to like precog your eventual audience. Just think about why you're excited to do something and, and be, be really honest and clear about that. I think that people ultimately back projects because they, there's like some hum, human connection that gets made through watching that video and getting a sense of who someone is. And it's that trust um, and that display of belief in another person, I think, that has enabled so many things to happen for it to be so powerful. Um, and so I would say don't get in the way of that. Don't outsmart that. You know, the sort of the, the core uh, thesis points that we're in our year in review at the start of the year, but we think about all the time. So we believe that people are amazing, that ideas are exhilarating, and we're all capable of creating incredible things. And there's just that optimism and love that underlies everything we try to do. Um, and I would hope to see, I would try to inspire that same sort of feeling in creators. And I think if they come with that and they're honest and transparent with folks, I think things will generally turn out okay. Yancy, thank you very much. That was beautiful. Thank you, sir. Yancy Strickler, best guy in tech.